darker during the pandemic, like darkest time. And I think Thank it's an annual program that we do. Excellent. Um, congratulations. So glad that uh, we could support that effort. Um, and we hope to be able to support all of the efforts of all of our main streets and because you guys are doing fantastic work throughout and we are continuing to uh, figure out ways to uh, support your main street programs. Um, and anybody else have a shout out or anything else that they want to, to add? I went to a wine stroll this last weekend. Oh, okay. How was it? It was, it was very interesting. <laughs> um, don't necessarily know that it was allowed, but um, <laughs> um, everyone seemed to have fun. And from what I heard after I talked to the organization that ran it, um, they didn't receive any complaints. Um, however, I would say about 90% of the people weren't wearing masks and indoors and outdoors. So it was definitely a little bit of a stretch, but um, it was kind of nice to see something normal. <laughs> Where was this? Um, it was in Brentwood. Oh, oh, and that's Contra Costa County. Mm -hmm. mm. I don't, I don't know that the county knew what was happening. No, they shut. They tried to do one in November, she said, and they were shut down for that one. Um, but I, they didn't have ABC license, like I know most of us in this area are required to have um, at each business. Mm -hmm. um, so they got away with that one, and then um, I don't know that the health department knew about it, but. Um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. <laughs> wow. And was there another comment from anyone? <clears throat> I think I hear Norma in the background somewhere there. Norma, are you here? I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Well, we, <laughs> we acknowledged Norma at our, um, our Main Street Now conference, and Norma is our longest serving uh, executive director and we um, just want to lift you up and thank you for all the great work that you've been doing for over 30 years at your Main Street. It's 31, honey. 31. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. It was quite an honor. I really enjoyed it. And it was a great conference. I'm thank proud you. of all you Main Streeters. We're the best. Yes, we are. Well, <laughs> joining us today is Kelly. I can never pronounce your name quite right. <laughs> So I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, everybody. My name is Kelly Humrickhauser. No, I just renamed myself. Um, I'm the Director of Government Affairs at the National Main Street Center, Government Relations. And um, uh, Amanda asked me to come today to talk to everybody about uh, funding opportunities through the American Rescue Plan. Um, and I think I'm happy to give the other, like a broader perspective too, but I have to say, there's a, a big world of funding opportunities coming out and I want to make sure that we're somewhat targeted in our conversation and I have a very easy ability to roll down some rabbit holes if people if people want to go there. So I'm um, happy to always, if there's anything that comes up specifically, I'm always happy to talk offline too. Um, so uh, just making sure to note that up front. Um, I also have, until we more recently hired, uh, a, 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 I don't know if Amanda has mentioned, uh, Amanda's role here at the National Main Street Center is, of course, with the California Main Street Program, and that's unique for us having a coordinating program under our kind of umbrella, but uh, in, in an organizational capacity, but we also do have the Illinois program. Um, and so up until recently, I was also uh, the kind of coordinator of the Illinois Main Street program. Um, we've recently hired a wonderful, wonderful new colleague, uh, Joy Austin, who's joining our team uh, to be the director of the Illinois Main Street program and have a very similar role to Amanda's. And I'm so pleased for that, but it also means that I have some background and capacity in understanding what Amanda's doing and what you guys are hearing. Maybe it's different in Illinois, but working one-on-one -on -one, uh, or one on 12 with the communities um, is a specific role, of course. and. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to kind of give a combination today of like what we've been giving, um, you know, we've, we've, we did a national webinar last week and some of you I know were there. Um, so I don't wanna be completely repetitive to that, but I also was thinking that we could have a kind of conversation some of the types that we've been having in Illinois a little bit where we're opening up the dialogue for challenges, opportunities, what you're hearing uh, and what you need. So um, pause for a moment and just set the stage here. Um, if you could, uh, 
Do you guys just generally broadly, I just want to open for a moment if, if anybody wants to tell me what they've heard about American Rescue Plan funding, specifically state and local dollars. You know, what have you, what's your level of, of uh, participation with that in your community so far? And or uh, if you don't know anything, please tell me because then we'll start really at the top and that's that's totally fine. Hey, Dolly, it's this one are okay. offered. I attended the webinar offered from the Main Street now uh, last week. So okay. I don't know if anyone else did, but that was really helpful. I did too. And my big takeaway from that was that we're going to have to stick up for ourselves because the cities are really interested in saving the money for themselves. Yeah, the, only th the only thing we're really working on right now is that the restaurant one has rolled out. Um, and just heads up for this area, SBA is doing community training for your restaurants. We're having one on Friday. And Darlene, uh, do you guys remember Darlene Rios Drapkin? She's actually the rep that's doing our training. <laughs> and she was Fruitvale's Main Street director for years. Um, so just, I, I'm more than happy to you know, open it up to you guys to attend uh, on Friday, if anybody's interested. Uh, Jen and then Alicia, I think. Jen, if you wanted, you made a comment. I just wanted to attend uh, Rachel's offer. Okay. Oh, Rochelle. Okay. Oh, Rochelle, sorry. Uh huh. And then uh, Alicia, you had your hand raised. Yeah. So, in terms of what we've heard, we've heard, you know, the bulk numbers of the estimated funds are coming at both the county level and our city level. Um, we haven't really heard too much. And well, I guess like we have, what I've heard is that each county and city is determining how they want to spend the funds differently. And that it is pretty much incumbent upon various community groups to lobby and to advocate for funds to be spent um, uh, you know, to be invested into community efforts. Um, the city of Richmond is hosting a series of community budget meetings. Um, I'll be attending the one that's happening this Thursday. Um, I haven't heard very much from the county level in terms of like a formal structure that they might be setting up maybe like they might have done with the CARES Act funds. Um, it just, it does feel very clear that like it's incumbent upon all the various players to really stay engaged and attend these kind of um, seemingly esoteric <laughs> community meetings and commission meetings to really figure out how to navigate the system and to advocate for ourselves, which is quite a heavy lift, um, especially with organizations that are super small and also experiencing a lot of transitions and haven't received any or very little support from these county and local governments essentially kind of doing the relief efforts that that we feel like they maybe should have been doing last year. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, I think Alicia, you said it in a very, um, a very cogent way, I think, because for anybody that was attending that, the, the webinar last week, and I'm gonna do just a brief overview of what that was so that we're just like on the same page really quickly before we, before we dive in a little bit more. But one thing that I found really interesting was, you know, we went over that webinar and at the end there, we got a question and I can't remember who it was from, but it was a very like, why wouldn't this be an appropriate, this is an appropriate question, it's an entirely appropriate question, but it was like, is there a form to fill out to request these funds? And I kind of like chuckled to myself a little bit because, you know, I think the, the number one thing to start with with understanding this is just how unprecedented it is, right? The, the treasury giving money directly to every municipality in the country, it has not happened. Now there's conversations happening saying, should we do this again? Should we, you know, cities are under, the, under pressure to make sure that they're doing this correctly because there is this new avenue of thought that maybe as opposed to block grants that, you know, um, would be kind of available, but, you know, you got to fight for it. That the best way to, to really, from an equity standpoint, make sure that every community is getting what they need is to go direct to community. And of course, that didn't used to be really an option. We didn't have the kind of technology that we do now. Um, so that's kind of made it more possible that, 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 that we could um, not just in this moment, but in the future, do things like that. Um, but then it does give a lot of authority to the cities, right? A ton of, of discretion around how they're going to do that locally. So, you know, um, 
I'm actually really interested to hear that Alicia said that they have those hearings, those open community meetings around budget, um, and hopefully that that's something that can uh, be replicated in other communities because I'm not I'm not hearing that everywhere. But um, okay, does everybody want to start at the top real quick? We'll do just an overview, just make sure that we're all on the same page. That'd be great. Right. Okay, so this is this is if you attended last week's webinar, this is going to be pretty similar. So. I apologize, but we'll do uh, quick to just make sure everybody has the, the opportunity to uh, participate in the same way. Okay, screen shared. Are you guys seeing the, the full screen PowerPoint? Uh, not the full screen. Ah, okay, hold on one second. I realized what I did. Okay. Here we are. Okay, so um, I might spend more, a little bit more time here than I did on, on last week's webinar for anybody that attended, just to make sure that we're kind of capturing some of these other programs that are part of ARP2. But again, as I said off top, I don't want to go down too many rabbit holes so that we stay focused. But this $1.9 trillion package, it's way more than just $350 billion that's going to stay yeah, in yes. cities. It's a lot of things. One of those things is an extension of the PPP program. It's now set to expire on 531. I've, I've you know, honestly, um, I've, I've now seen some new forms of, uh, forms of advocacy to say, you know, we could extend PPP further. We could dole out more, more loans like that, but what businesses really need is just grants, right? And I think that that's two things, right? It's one, that's been a conversation all along, right? Shouldn't there just be a grant pool for, for businesses as part of this federal funding? I doubt, I doubt highly that that will happen, um, but uh, it does also put the pressure, I think, on uh, cities and states to figure out, could they be doing something like that with their funding that they have um, through, through, through ARP? A lot of people are thinking that, uh, I think that the, the small business uh, scenario right now, we've seen there's now some specific funding for shutter, shuttered venue operators. So if you are working with anybody who's a, a movie theater, a, a events or performance space, I think that you know those grant programs are now out that got a rough start, but it's now uh, launched and out there. Um, Restaurant Revitalization Fund, as uh, Rochelle mentioned, that is, that is out there as of Monday, they started accepting applications. The other thing that I'm very uh, interested in, I think, is going actually kind of well with that program is that if you're a restaurant um, that has a pre-existing relationship with something like Square, there's a few different businesses where they've, they've actually partnered with those, those kind of operators of um, platforms to allow for the application to be streamlined. So, of course, if you're on Square and you have all of your uh, receipts backlogged there for the past year, a lot of your business information is already saved there. And so... SBA is working directly with a few of those providers, and I'm gonna, I'm not gonna be able to remember all of them off the top of my head. Uh, it's Square, it's, no, I'm very bad. Um, so, but, but there is an opportunity for some businesses to work if they already are using a platform for some restaurants to go ahead and, and just file through that platform, fill out the application there. That means that they don't actually have to create a profile on the SBA site. And it means that they uh, will have some of that pre-filled for them. Um, so that is one option. We're very, we've been very, um, focused on in terms of resources. I, there's lots of different ways to get resources out there. I think the SBA is, is, is doing a really good job in comparison to how they got shuttered venues off the ground, shuttered venue operators off the ground. They think that with restaurant revitalization funds, they've taken a, a bit of a stronger hold. I've seen so many different programs out there in Illinois. There's been, you know, one-on-one -on -one type of uh, counseling as well. And then, uh, you know, lots of, lots of webinars with getting people uh, completed with the application. So literally you could, you could probably find one at almost any time, right? To to um, have a have a restaurant join into, or there's recordings online. Um, but I think the other uh, thing to, to know here is that when initially I, I've, I saw estimates that said that this program was going to be oversubscribed within the first day. Now they haven't said anything to that extent yet, right? But there's only uh, I, I know only 28.6 billion dollars here, but that, that's gonna that's gonna go, and there's conversations that that could be uh, refunded, um, re reallocated. Um, 
Thank you, Alicia, for putting in the POS partners. <laughs> um, and then the Community Navigators Program, SBA just released slightly more information on this, but I, I, it's not very much more information. This is a $100 million program that is for organizations that are helping businesses access other, other SBA programs. So if, if you have been helping businesses access PPP, idle, shuttered venues, restaurant revitalization fund, hey, you might be somebody that qualifies to be funded through this program, but they haven't put a NOFO out yet, a, a notice of funding um, or an application process. And so this $100 million was kind of like, yeah, there's this new program, it's gonna be uh, implemented and we're gonna work with places like SBDCs and women's and minority development centers. But I think, the, I think the goal is to extend the reach of those types of organizations and there has to be other entities involved there so it can fund nonprofits that are doing this type of work. That means that it's possible that you could, you could apply. It's, what we're unclear of yet is what, um, does it have to be the entity on the ground and where does the application process move? What is the structure of this program? Um, the, uh, the language is very clear that it's about helping businesses both in rural and uh, underserved and minority areas connect to resources. So this can be about um, you know, providing translations, uh, getting people access to accounting and other services. This is uh, uh, really about making sure that businesses have the, the technical assistance. So it's like the four points, but only under the EV point, only under the point about specifically helping businesses uh, get access to these programs, but you're doing that, right? So um, we're looking to that and continuing to look to that. And um, the actual model that they're using, Community Navigator, is really interesting. It, it's uh, a model that was, um, it's, been, it's been around for a little while, but it's really about using um, like a spoken wheel, right? So, you know, there's the ability to, at the community level, say, okay, we're going to get these resources out by, by pushing them out through people who are connecting to these different entities. You are one of those connectors, right? So if you're connecting to all those different businesses, it, it seems like it's directly uh, for us, but we're, we're not, we don't have all the information yet. Um, the State Small Business Credit Initiative is a program that will uh, basically help fund entrepreneurship through the states. Um, and it's been re-upped from, from its previous kind of uh, operational, like it, it ended in 2017, I think. Um, so th they're, they're kind of re-upping this and it could offer us more, more um, funding for, for entrepreneurship initiatives. And, and um, we could do a separate program on that. Maybe Main Street will do the leading organization on that is uh, really, um, uh, community development finance um, folks. Um, the real buckets though that, you know, we want to look at here, both the Economic Development Administration and, you know, I think Amanda has probably talked to you in the past about that funding and so we don't necessarily need to spend too much time on it here other than to say um, there is a carve out of this funding at 25% for organizations that, you know, so $3 billion dollars goes to the Economic Development Administration. There's a carve out of that funding that is specifically for tourism impacted communities, right? So I, I would imagine that's many of us, right? Um, so uh, I, I specifically call that out because they're still deciding at, at the EDA how that funding is gonna go out. It might maybe go out as a block grant so that states are getting this other little pool for tourism, in which case, we would want to look to that um, in a different way. Um, in any circumstance, another avenue to be thinking about is how you locally partner with other organizations to access funding like EDA. The typical process there is very much based on those local partnerships. Now, we're trying to approach it differently for Main Street programs because of the operations uh, through the state program, right? But typically, you're looking at this um, with other uh, regional folks and you'd be putting together an application and uh, for the tour tourism specific dollars, you'd wanna partner with your tourism organization to be thinking about how you guys work together on a project uh, to access that funding. Um, again, the application's not out yet. They haven't decided El Paso. Um, what they're doing with it yet. El Paso. Oh. But we will uh, keep an eye on that for you. Um, state and local funding, what we're really talking about here. Oh, I had another thing. This is open now. Uh, 
we've talked about it. Okay. Um, uh, this hasn't changed much from the, from the last time that we talked about it. We don't know a whole lot more, but we're anticipating knowing more um, soon. So if you're a municipality above a population of $50,000, your city is getting money directly from the treasury. If you're a population below 50,000 or 50,000 in people, <laughs> sorry, you're getting money through the state. Um, a lot of my folks in Illinois, which is a cash strap state, are very concerned that they're never going to see a dollar. That is not true because the state uh, really can't, can't hamper with the amount that you're going to get. The amount is set by treasury and they have to pass it through to you, right? So they have a, a timeline and penalties if they don't. Um, so if you're interested and you don't know the amount that your city is going to be receiving, there is a list uh, from the National League of Cities. Uh, the list is still not 100% final because uh, the, the uh, Treasury is basically interpreting the guidance that was given by, by Congress. And so the National League of Cities has been doing a pretty good job about like making sure to adjust from those initial estimates that came out from Congress. But you, uh, you're going to get a good, a pretty good idea from their list. Um, if, if you, uh, if you haven't checked that out yet, I will uh, send you the link because it's good to know what your city's getting. Um, hold on one second. I'm going to find you that link. And we're below, so we're hitting up the state, right? Here we go. Okay, so if you, um, if, you, if you don't know, take a look on that list, you'll find out your amount of funding. Now, NLC, the National League of Cities would, would tell you some cities are getting so much more than they need, right? Some cities, maybe they have pandemic losses that they can calculate and say, and I'm not saying more than they need from a perspective of like, cities need money, right? Cities need a lot of money. I'm not saying that from the perspective of like every, covering everything they need, just in terms of pandemic direct impact, right? A city might say, uh, for example, I've heard a city getting uh, $8 million has $400,000 in direct pandemic impacts that they've calculated. That is, that is great money in excess of that, right? And the city now has uh, the ability to prioritize some projects and, and that's possible. It is also possible that your city is not getting a full amount to even cover their, their pandemic impacts. And I just wanna make that clear because I've heard a couple of instances where people are saying, you know, the city isn't getting as much uh, as another city and, and all of the allocations are of course different based on formula and, and uh, um, kind of, there's two different types of formulas based on the community size. But, um, but there are some cities that were just harder hit by the pandemic. And this funding doesn't take into account kind of the actual impacts on the ground of you know, what the city's losses might have been because of the pandemic. So there are some cities that just aren't going to have as much to, to play with. And when I say play with, I mean for, for things that weren't about direct pandemic impacts, right? Um, so, it's kind of difficult to assess that for your own city, right? I mean, you have to kind of be in conversation with them to understand what amount are they actually looking at for this, for this funding that might be available to other entities. And, and, and that's, that's very nuanced. I would say, you know, it's something to just be aware of, but um, it, some, some cities are going to give feedback to external groups that says that they don't have as much as they, as, as others. And, and it's possible that that's partly true. Um, so just to reset on the funding too, your funding is going to come in two, two tranches. So the first is going to come within the next, it could come as early as next week for some cities. Um, that's the 60 day mark. And that was what was in the legislation as that is when it needs to start rolling from treasury. It's very possible that doesn't happen because rarely do things happen as they're supposed to. Um, but uh, if, if it followed those guidelines, it would be for cities above 50K about May 10th, 11th, and then for cities below 50K, June 10th, 11th, because city uh, that uh, the population where the money's going to the state first, they get about 30 days there. And then it'll come in a year 
from now on. And that's so unclear. It's a year from the initial allocation, it seems, so that it would come in May or June of 2022. Um, so the first tranche is a, um, it's only one part of, of the funding. It's not exactly half the first tranche is more, but um, it, 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 there, is, there is a timeline here where the city, you know, doesn't need to spend it all immediately and they're gonna get another bucket. Um, the deadline for spending the funds uh, from the legislation is 12-31-24. That is, you know, unclear. Also, there could be some, what if you spent it on something that's a longer term project? Can you have um, obligated it, but not yet spent it? There's a possibility for that. Um, it is still unclear. So, uh, we don't know yet what the exact amounts will be. We don't know about some restrictions on uses. There's a lot of questions, particularly around the infrastructure uses of this funding. Don't necessarily know the reporting requirements other than there's two sides of this coin. Of course, um, cities are gonna be concerned to do their best job possible with this um, as it represents the opportunity that more funding might flow in this manner. Um, and there, of course, will be reporting requirements, but there's also 19,000 cities getting funding out of this, and how much can Treasury really, really track uh, what they're all doing? So um, some folks are, um, uh, you know, concerned that there might not be appropriate reporting here. Um, and then again, the question of, is there a possibility to obligate funds without having spent them? Um, and just to highlight here, there are four uses of funds outlined in the legislation. Recovering from COVID-19 economic impacts, revenue replacement. So if the city lost money, the city can replace that money with this money. Premium pay to essential workers, which I think does have an implication for us. I don't know about you guys, but I'm seeing workforce development issues out the wazoo. People cannot hire for businesses to get just, you know, things open for the summer. Um, there there is the possibility here of, um, of paying what's designated as an essential worker in your state. So it's your governor's designation of an essential worker, paying that person uh, essentially over time um, with, with this funding and, and even a back pay for that. Um, uh, Bettina has her hand raised. Bettina, oh, did yeah, you have sure. a question directly? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if the revenue replacement can be for parking services, say if a city through their parking enterprise fund um, had free parking for, for COVID or is our enterprise is not part of that? Um, no, it should because, um, well, I guess I don't know how exactly how it's structured, but they, one, they could pass through to a, a as you'll see on the other side, the ability, the ability to transfer if there's a special unit per uh, unit special purpose unit of government, or if it's part of, uh, 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 I guess I don't know how the enterprise is really structured, but I think it's possible for sure. Okay. Um, Thank you. Unless it's a for-profit entity. No, I think it's just that the, for our city at least in San Luis Obispo, the parking enterprise is a an enterprise, not a part of the general fund. So yeah, they have I, their I, bonds I, separate. There hasn't been full clear information yet on kind of that from the budget perspective of the city, right? And I, I don't think that there would be any restriction on that. Um, I couldn't imagine that there would be. Um, I think that would be a pretty applicable use. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing uh, to note, um, just in terms of some of these questions, right? Like. Uh, infrastructure, water, sewer, broadband. The actual legislation says water, sewer, or broadband, which made a lot of people concerned that we couldn't do multiple of those things, right? Like you could only pick one that you were going to do. Like people really need some interpretation just to make sure that this is all clear and what exactly type of water projects would, would qualify. There's, um, there's just a lack of clarity there. So um, I, I think um, to just continuing on the, the ability to transfer um, the you, what's most important I want to highlight is that you know if your budget has been impacted if you're a nonprofit organization they can spend money and send money to you because you are a private nonprofit that seems pretty clear from the legislation right that if you're um, demonstrating a need from COVID economic impacts or planning for recovery from COVID economic impacts that that would be an appropriate use of this funding. Um, 
these other types, I mean, there, there is the possibility that someone who will work in kind of with a special unit of government, um, they can pass to a state government. Somebody asked me if they could pass to a county government. It's just not in the legislation. It's very possible that they could come out with guidance that would say differently. I don't know why a city would want to pass to a county when counties are also getting a boom. Um, the guidance here is the guidance at, right now from the legislation, full stop. So this is also true for the state. This is also true for the county. Um, this isn't just for the cities. I think we're mostly focused on our cities, but it depends on your relationship with your counties, right? Like their counties aren't gonna know exactly what to do with this funding either. But the general guidance that we've also heard um, while we're waiting for um, more guidance here, and I'm super like, I don't wanna say, I, you know, I, I, well, I don't wanna be wrong, right? Like that you could use it for something. I'm, I'm not talking. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, CJ. Hi. Yeah, everybody, could you mute yourself if you're not asking a question? Thanks. Um, but uh, I, I don't, I, I don't, um, uh, if you did it, the, what I've heard from NLC is if you did it with the CARES Act funding, you could do it with this funding. So I think that provides uh, a very, like, that's not necessarily firm, but it is, um, but they anticipate that it would not be more restrictive. And so a lot of people did a lot of things with CARES Act funding. Um, so that they, that would all be applicable uses uh, potentially of this funding. Um, so uh, there, there is some more guidance coming down. Hopefully it'll be coming very soon. Your city is probably preparing for this. They're probably hearing from folks about this. Um, and they are probably, uh, uh, already talking internally, if they haven't made it public at all yet, they're already talking internally about what they're gonna do with this money that comes. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we're kind of focused on that guidance being being addressed to cities um, and, uh, and, and how Main Street fits into this. Um, because I think, you know, the guidance that, that, that entities give to cities is, I mean, it, it doesn't, doesn't mean a whole lot, you know, that cities can do whatever they please at the end of the day based, but based on forthcoming regs, but the, um, the guidance about how they should approach this, that they're, that they might be seeing, it would tell them to, you know, assess government and community needs, like understand what their direct impacts are. But I think that Main Street programs have the particular ability to be helpful with the assessment of community needs, if they are all interested in what's going on with their small businesses, have you surveyed lately? Do you have an understanding of what's happening on the ground in your community that you can prepare and share? Like, how can you make sure that Main Street's voice is is included in in any assessment that the local government might be needing, but might be um, seeking, so that they can prioritize funding. Um, you know, we all, um, I think at a certain point this past year, everybody was just surveyed out, right? Um, nobody wanted to talk about it anymore, but if you want to make the case to your city that there is uh, an existing and ongoing need for your downtown entities, whether that's small businesses or property owners, it could be a very good time to just do a quick, a quick check-in um, and make sure that you are um, making sure to represent that voice to the city. Um, the second bullet is to use revenue sources strategically. And I, I think, you know, we're focused very much on this ARP funding, but the, the goal that cities are, are hearing is that, you know, this shouldn't, this shouldn't be the only bucket they're looking at, right? So of course, you know, if you're going to make the case, if you're going to make the case to your city that your businesses need X or your restaurants also need X, they're going to want to know that everybody has tried the other avenues, right? So did your, did your businesses apply for PPP? I'm sure at this point you have a pretty good sense of whether or not that's happened. But are they applying for the restaurant revitalization fund? If you can say they applied, they got, they got uh, you know, only a quarter of what they really needed through this funding, that might make a better case for why the city needs to support small businesses in some way. Right? I know it's hard to keep your pulse on entirely, but if you're helping businesses with those applications, track through what happened at the end so that you can help them make that case. Um, uh, the priority for fiscal stability and returning to work, I don't think that's a, um, you know, a surprise, right? So the cities would be looking to make sure that they're fiscally stable, right? So um, that's a that's a great goal, and then returning to work also I think that has other um, implications for our um, 
you know, what city might, cities might be think, thinking that they need to spend on in terms of getting, whether it's teachers back in the classroom or, you know, some essential services back going, um, if anything like that uh, is an impact, they might be looking there first. Rochelle has her hand raised. Rochelle. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Amanda. I, the reason I did it twice is I used the wrong hand. Um, <laughs> so I, now I have the hand up. So just backing up real quick, Kelly, this is great. And you were mentioning um, the survey to your businesses. We just did that because we are starting our recovery plan. And um, we actually even had, you know, have them state which assistance programs did you apply for? And that spoke volumes. Uh, we also, you know, what kind of help do you need? It came out with marketing, social media training. So if anybody needs that, that's another thing I can send you our survey monkey to see what kind of questions we were asking. Kept it quick and simple. Uh, yeah, I'll send it because it, it did. It's, it's going to be used really well in tandem with this when we're talking to the city because we know what we need money for. Yeah, send it to, to all of us, at, uh, Rochelle. You okay. can start to send it to me and I can dis distribute it to everyone. Got it, perfect. Great, great. I just want to make sure um, I'm collecting as much as possible. So I encourage you, um, any of you, if you have like a good example, like send it on over. Like we we can only share, you know, out what we what we know is happening in other communities and we, we depend on you for, for um, sharing with us sometimes. Um, Okay, so maintaining records, using your congressional delegation. One thing that Main Street is super shiny about, and don't let anybody ever forget it, is that if a, con if a congressional office, uh, if a, a legislator wants a great picture, the best freaking place in the world to do that is in a Main Street and in a downtown, right? Like, so uh, there's one way that you can always be at the table is in terms of helping your city organize any sort of site visits that they might have, you know, be a friend to them in that manner. Um, this isn't just guidance for this moment, that's always. <laughs> um, okay, so I wanna get to the, get to more of the point about talking about what we ought to be thinking about. And I think we started that a little bit, but open some discussion here because I've been talking for way too long. I apologize, I ramble. Um, but just thinking that we need to be thinking, you know, for, for recovery here, we need to be thinking in two ways. The first of which is meeting immediate needs. What are we telling our city that we need immediately in order to recover? And the second is, what is the vision for the downtown that you want to share so that your city can prioritize you through these funds or let's, you know, this is, a, we're in a wild world of spending right now. So. There might be other opportunities coming forward that, you know, as long as you have a, a vision prepared, um, that's, that's important. So these are kind of the steps that, you know, I've discussed with other coordinators, other communities across the country in terms of kind of getting ready, right? And I think for one, I've heard from a few of you, you've started to be involved in the conversation. Um, any thoughts on how anybody is approaching this in terms of how are you getting to the table? How are you structured to be at the table already? So I, I heard from Alicia that they she's attending a, a city meeting. Are others already set up to um, kind of lobby or, or engage with uh, city government or state? I met Derek, with, what's going on? I met with our local economic development manager and uh, regarding requesting for funding is one of our priorities and uh, Rick and I will probably get together to see how we can create a atomized list of things where we can help our budget. You know, one of them um, issues is the back rent on our building, uh, which is huge. And then also is uh, our overhead. It's, uh, it's you know fixed costs that we we need to also put that in mind but we're working with our local economic development manager thanks Gamaro. and then michelle yeah i you know again it's it's kind of like thank god we already had things in place before covid because the communication was already good to go and um so it's things like if you don't already have it officially have basically a liaison on council 
that's your go-to for your downtown. And as Kelly mentioned, they love that because they get all the attention. <laughs> they get the ribbon cuttings at the events. They get, you know, like, look what I did. Um, but that's helped huge because that one reports back to our mayor who used to be our liaison. So by the, the fact that we change over every couple of years, they all get a real good immersion into what we're about and they do start worrying. So um, I think, you know, that liaison piece and just learn to be pushy. It's not, it's, it's not inappropriate to call the city manager. It's not inappropriate to call the mayor um, and just be careful which businesses you bring with you uh, <laughs> on those. Cause sometimes that takes it off track of this is for everybody. We care about everybody. We're not just a restaurant organization. We're not just, you know, that's gimme, gimme or whatever. So, uh, but I think just getting those conversations going and getting your bigger thinkers uh, with you on the team. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's entirely true. And I think all of us in our city know that we have people who have easier, uh, an easier way to open some doors, right? And if they're participating in our organization, how can we activate them in this moment? Uh, Rick, did you want to add a comment? I, I just would say that um, the city seemed, well, number one, the city is in really good shape financially. They, we have four Walmarts in the town. Our sales tax revenue is up. Property tax revenue is up. Of course, coastal Southern California beach, beach town is property tax revenue is up. And so uh, we just passed uh, sales tax right before the, the pandemic. So uh, the, the city is pretty well off financially. Um, they seemed really super interested in asking for input on how to spend this $33 million at the beginning. And now they don't seem like they're interested as much. And you know, then we're hearing back, well, the money won't be coming until May. We don't know what the restrictions are. So um, I'm just gonna be interested to hear it play out, but as, uh, or see it play out, but as Gamaro said, we're continuing to dialogue with them, let them know that there are needs um, not only for Main Street, but uh, for our for our small businesses. And and just real quick to add to that, Rick, I think part, one of the things we have to look at when we're talking to our city city officials is they're in self preservation mode too. You know, many of the cities have had to lay off people, and they're they feel like they're under understaffed, and so it is it does become kind of you know every man for themselves a little bit in the mentality of that. So we're really pushing programs that are gonna help get sales tax back up. What are economic investments they can help in our economy that creates more money? Um, and I think that if you know, if you keep that mantra going, we all love the arts, but I think the arts aren't always, you know, they're trying to say, but it makes everyone feel better. Well, sometimes the cities don't hear that. They're like, yeah, but that, that costs us money doesn't make us money. So we're really trying to tie everything, including the arts into economic. Um, and, and fortunately, Main Streets are good at talking that way. Yeah, and don't forget the arts do have economic impacts. Right. Can... Yeah. <laughs> no, no, and I, and I, I- We just have to talk about it in that way. That's as, as exactly framework. right. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of our arts groups are just screaming for money and not tying that together. It's they're yeah. going a, a too much emotion and not enough eco eco economics. I can't even talk. Okay. Yeah, there's another big, big, big ask out there for arts groups that could that could happen in the American Jobs Plan, and that's just the other thing to keep in keep in mind. There's there's still more money coming down to cities, which uh, not to cities, but to to well to everyone um, in some in some manner. Um, through a next steps, uh, a next steps bill too. I just um, I, I recognize our time is limited, so I want to you know keep keep talking about and, and, and yeah. Main Street um, put together a couple of worksheets. Um, I have to say they're um, they're just high level, right? Just trying to get you started on the ideation and getting kind of your thoughts together. But if you don't have something that kind of puts together what your impact was during the uh, during the pandemic and how you might structure that for your cities. Just think about all the businesses that you helped. Think about everybody who has a, a, a footprint that is earning tax income right now because you kept their doors open and you kept their lights on, right? Like how can you calculate what that means to the city 
and package that so that the city understands what you have done, right? Um, we could give you national data in certain ways about the overall impact, but that's not talking directly to the legislatures, legislators, legis council people in your community, right? So you want to make sure to just hyper localize that impact. Um, you know, put it around what your what your what your downtown is, and think about. Think about your property owners. If you did have some sort of rent uh, rent program, that would be also excellent to include because if they're going to be looking to keep those programs going. They might not recognize where where that impact came from locally, right? So it's never a bad time to have something put together. So there's a, a worksheet there and some talking points to help you kind of get that started. We recommend that you have something on hand. Maybe some of you have already done this put something together so that in the circumstance that you're asked or that you can get your way to that table if you're not already there, you have something to hand out. And finally, I just wanna make sure that we're talking about as, as um, Rick was saying that they are first, we're interested in a little bit of his vision. I think there was a little bit of backtracking on the national kind of conversation about this because it was like, all oh, this money's coming, get your project ideas together. And then folks began to be like, oh, wait a minute, there's gonna be regs here. What are we going to do, right? So um, there, there is a lot of hesitancy, I think, about saying more about it right now because we're still waiting on that guidance. Um, as soon as that guidance comes down, we're going to do another webinar. I'm, I'm, I'm penciling it in. Um, we haven't gotten any information about it out yet, which is, I got a second shot of the vaccine and it knocked me on the ground for a couple of days. So, um, but we'll do it on Monday the 17th, hopeful that we're getting more, that the guidance is coming out prior to that and that we can um, do another national webinar that would get into that a little bit more because we think at that point we should be hopefully able to say more specifically what types of projects are going to be applicable under this if there's things that aren't, get those off the docket a little bit. I do wanna um, point to, if, if anybody participated in that webinar last week, we did have a, 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 a good conversational component with uh, Kim from Pigtown in Baltimore talking about what the Baltimore Main Streets have put together to ask to the city there. Now in Baltimore, there's uh, eight Main Street programs. So it's a little bit different than some of your programs locally, but just before this call, actually I got her final product about what their budget looks like for some of these things and I'm just going to quickly share it with you because I think it's uh, good to see what other folks are putting together for this and there aren't super many examples that I've seen yet so now as Kim mentioned on that call what they're the way that they're approaching this is to like exploit their relationship with Senator Van Hollen who's you know on federally, so they're gonna just make sure that they are um, using as much as they can to leverage that relationship into making sure the city gives them some of this money, right? Great approach, right? You had somebody from a different level who was responsible for getting the funding in the first place, coming in to say, this is how this funding ought to be spent locally. Do you have any relationship with anybody federal level? You, you know, even st at state level never, never hurts, right? having them sign on to what your ask is, 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 is great. So um, they are making sure to include everyone on this. They've, they've pulled all the partners together. And what this is, is a list of the, of the different ways that they want to help the business community and the commercial corridor. Um, so they are putting together a little bit of uh, the data here, you know, how much, impact that they're having and just what this proposal is. It's very brief, it's not super in depth, but it gives a, a general idea. They're gonna be asked for more information about this, I'm guessing, and provide more here, but, um, but they're gonna provide grant funds uh, for brick and mortar and facade improvements, um, business attraction money, uh, vacancy reduction um, to help with, with negligent property owners, um, emergency fair, uh, gap funding for businesses, event support for the corridors, program operations, street safety. They're covering everything here. They didn't minimize their ask to one project or idea. This is how, and you know what? This is Main Street work, right? They're funding things that they would be doing anyway, right? The only thing that I'm not super seeing here is like, uh, uh, oh, program operations. Great, because I want to make sure that they did that. Program operations, make sure to just fund your program if you can. Um, coordination for their city level staff. That's also good, of course. So for you, but that would be under program operations. Um, 
And then their budget, right? So I think relevant to us here, this is the per district budget in this area. So they're really asking for per district about a half a million dollars. Um, so if you if you feel that, you know, what level is appropriate for this ask, if we're getting there, and we have like one minute left, so I'm sorry to be like over your time, but um, it, think about what the city is getting. Think about what your budget is. Think about it is 1% of what they're getting something that you could ask for, right? 1% uh, of 33 million is a lot of money. You know, could you, do you have a plan for that amount of money? Could you make an ask for 1%, right? Um, is, is that, does that make sense, right? So, okay, that's. I'll that's pause. great. Kelly, I love this. And I definitely, uh, please share it with me. I think this would be perfect for uh, us the board, CAMSA board to come together and put together this kind of plan for California to ask. The ask would be really enormous <laughs> uh, in terms of if we were trying to get, you know, um, I don't know, uh, $500,000 for or $50,000 for each uh, community. So um, yeah, but I think that's a, a great start. And I did see that Bettina and was it Michelle also still had their hand open? Their hand open, up, raised. Bettina? I had my hand up, but you oh, I'm answered. sorry, Gamaro. No, you. you you actually said what I was going to say. So no, that's perfect. Thank okay. you, Amanda. Yeah, and I was just going to ask if you had a crystal ball, which I know you don't, but um, to sort of get a sense of whether you think it's worth shooting our shot now or waiting a little longer until there's some more clarity about what's going to be regulated. It's super easy for your city to say right now. You, you go and ask them right now and they're going to say, well, there's not guidance yet, so we really can't say, and we're not prepared to say anything until there's guidance. So you want to start the conversation in terms of like, I would focus more in, on getting to the table if there's a recovery task force being, being organized, making sure that you have like a conversational kind of start. If you run into somebody at a coffee shop and say, oh my God, the city's getting so much money. Are you guys going to be okay? It sounds like you're going to be able to recover all of your losses. What are you going to do with all that extra money? <laughs> you know, be just, you know, weasel your way into the conversation a little bit, however you want to get to that table. Um, but, but I would wait and just be like, oh, <laughs> the guidance came out. We're all ready. Here's our plan. You know what I mean? Um, because I, I just think it's going to be really, really, really easy right now for somebody to push you back with a have to wait for guidance. So yeah. as much as you want to make that ask, the actual ask should probably come as soon as you can ensure that your plan fits into the guidance but you want to lay the groundwork. Well, and this is a hyper-specific question, but I, our city just went through a, a two-year budget process. And so that's been going on at the same time. I think that they actually were estimating these funds as part of their budget process. So it might be difficult for us to decouple, oh, you're getting this money and we have a plan for it versus this entire two-year financial plan that they've been proposing. And Do you have with. access to those? Is it public? Yeah, I mean, and we've been working with them on it every step of the way. It's just okay. our requests <laughs> sometimes get shaved off for other projects, you know. Right, right, right. I mean, in that circumstance, it just, it sounds like they, as much as they've planned it in, there has to be a conversation somewhere where they, where they are cognizant as well that there's not regs yet. And so any plans that they're making have to be a slightly uh, soft. I mean, I'm pretty sure they could say, you know, some pretty specific uses that they could acknowledge, but um, I think if you're if you're making a play in it, if, if if they've invited you into the budget process all along, they're going to say, "Oh, you've had the opportunity to ask kind of all along for this, right?" So if you want to have like a specific vision about it, I would try to cast it out a little bit further and say, you know, our goal is immediately to stabilize and then tranche two. If that's not planned in yet, what can we go for there when that comes around next year? I know that might not sound like super, but they might give you the feedback that like, oh, you've been at the table for this. You should have, you know what I mean? You know, on top of that too, I think we need to be aware, you know, since we're in emergency situation with COVID, many of our uh, city managers are now considered the emergency coordinator. And when, once they designate that their city is in an emergency situation, some of the rules of engagement with community, some of the uh, you know transparency rules and laws go out the window. So they don't have to follow as much 
input from communities. So that's why I do think, Bettina, get in there now, because I have no doubt my city manager is behind a closed door already coming up, <laughs> coming up with this. So we we're not going to wait and just. You know, like I know how much you're getting, buddy. You know what? What? Are, what are we looking at? So we may have to force more community engagement than they feel they have to do in an emergency situation. Yeah, I've heard that in some other places too. Just, um, just not not necessarily under the scope that you gave with the emergency thought process, but that the that the city is having the conversations. They know the conversations are happening, but they're happening behind a closed door, and that's not going to be just an issue for your group, since other groups are thinking about this too. If there is that need to force a conversation to come out into the open a little bit more, you might think about who else is not being invited to that table. Thanks, Kamara. Yeah. Are there other comments or questions um, before we let Kelly go? I know she has to get to another meeting. I wanna thank you so much, um, Kelly. And we will continue to be uh, engaged around this. And I think it is really imperative that we uh, really come up with a plan for California, as well as each of you for your city. So, um, you know, the whole advocacy piece is um, really crucial, I think, uh, to all of our organizations. And um, I'm going to keep pushing on this. And I also am reaching out to Renee Coleman um, to support us um, in our efforts. Uh, and she is um, in governmental uh, relations with the trust and uh, can help us uh, to pull together, I think a good plan as well in terms of uh, the outreach that we need to do. So any other comments or questions? Thanks for having me everybody. And I'm excited to work with Amanda Moore and Renee on just thinking about you guys holistically. Thanks everyone. And I did save the chat. If you didn't save it, you can save it too, but I, hopefully we can get this around and I did record today. So um, I can send that out if needed. All right, if there's nothing else, we'll see you next time. Thanks, bye-bye.